Well, I want to tell you a story today. It's just been on my mind. It's a little different kind of a sermon, a little different kind of a lesson. Uh, But let me start by this. I want to set the stage in this way. In 1914, as Europe was on the verge of World War I, there was an Englishman named Ernest Shackleton. And Ernest Shackleton was a polar explorer. He'd been on several polar expeditions. And he believed that the only remaining adventure, polar adventure left, was to go to the South Pole, but not just going to the South Pole, but walking across Antarctica on foot, traversing Antarctica on foot. Have to be done in the winter when the seas were frozen. And so he began to recruit a crew to go on this last great polar adventure. So he put an ad in the newspaper. I want to read you the ad he put in the paper. He said this, men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness. This gets better and better. Constant danger, safe return, doubtful. (laughs) Honor and recognition, though, in case of success. Well, by the way, how many of you would have answered that ad? How many of you out there? Okay, every one of you that would have answered this ad, we need you in our middle school ministry. (laughs) And so there's a table outside in all of our venues today. If you would go sign up, because this is the kind of people we're looking for. Okay, I'm, I'm kidding. No, not really. Middle schoolers. I believe there's a special place in heaven for people that that work with middle schoolers, bless their hearts. Well, let me tell you what happened shortly because this is one of the great heroic adventures of the 20th century. Basically, 28 guys set sail in a wooden ship called the Endurance, and they got to the South Polar ice cap, and it was particularly bad winter, and they literally got, the ship got stuck. It got frozen into the ice cap, and for 10 months, They drifted with the polar ice cap. Well, finally, the weight of the ice crushed their ship, and so they had to take all the things off the ship, and they camped for five months there on this big ice floe. Finally, the melt began, and so they took three lifeboats, and they were able to make their way to an island. And after this, uh, there are just so many unbelievable adventures of hardship and heroism and amazing things, but at the end of the story, about two years after they first set out, never having achieved their objective, of course, but two years after they had set out, they all made it back to England. Every man made it back. It's considered one of the great heroic adventures of the 20th century. Well, I want to talk to you about another heroic adventure, and this talk is called Uh, borrowing from Dr. Seuss, oh, the places you'll go. I want to tell you a story about an adventure, a Christian adventure from the New Testament. And then at the end, I want to try to convince you that you are on a similar adventure yourself. So first, let me set the stage for our story. We're going to go back to the beginning of the New Testament, and obviously we have to have a map. So I need to give you a map of the Roman Empire By the way, you have an insert with both of the maps I'm going to use today. Compliments of the ESV Bible Atlas. Very good maps. The Roman Empire, at the time of Jesus, the time of our story, the Romans controlled the entire Mediterranean area, and they also controlled uh, areas well outside the Mediterranean area. They were the dominant power in the world at that time. And so that had pros and it had cons. And the pros were that there was peace. It was called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. They were so powerful that there was basically peace. It was oppressive, which is the bad news. The Romans were rapacious and oppressive people, but there was no war. You had free travel. You had a lot of engineering going on. So the Romans are there at this perfect time. This is the time period into which Jesus is born. This is also the time period that a young man is born in a city called Tarsus. Tarsus on your map is a little bit west of Armenia. 
It's close to Antioch, Syria, but a little west of Armenia on your map. There's a little town named Tarsus, and a young man there is born to some Jewish parents, and they named him Saul. Now, Saul is a good Jewish name. Saul was, if you remember, the first Jewish king from 1000 BC. So, 1000 years later, this young boy is born, named him Saul. By the way, my grandfather's name, we do this in America too, his name was George Washington Fakes. In other words, sometimes we name people for heroes or people to whom we look up in the past. Well, that's what happened with Saul. But Saul had something else going for him. We don't know how this happened, but Saul was a Roman citizen. Now, that's rare. Far and away, most of the people in the Roman Empire were not citizens of the Roman Empire. They were subjects of the Roman Empire. You could occasionally buy citizenship, very hard to do, and occasionally the emperor would grant citizenship to people for certain acts of service to the Roman Empire, but not many people were citizens, and we don't know how Paul's parents became citizens. And I just called him Paul, and the reason I did was he was born Saul, good Jewish name, but when you are a Roman citizen, you have a Roman name. That's your legal name. We don't know his full Roman legal name, but we know his first name was Paulus. That's a good Latin name. It's a good Roman name. And so in the scriptures, he's spoken of as Saul by his Jewish name and Paul. That's very rare to have Roman citizenship, and it comes into use later. Well, let me fast forward now to 34 AD. 34 AD, and we're going to go to Jerusalem. Now, let me tell you what's just happened in Jerusalem. Jesus was crucified by the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, at the insistence of the Jewish leaders. And three days later, raised from the dead. And all through Jerusalem, there are people out, believers in Jesus Christ, preaching. What are they preaching? They're doing two things. They're saying, this Jesus is the Messiah. Open up your Bible, which was the Old Testament then, and he said, read, look at the prophecies. You just saw this happen. And there are hundreds of eyewitnesses here who saw him raised from the dead. And so they're preaching in Jerusalem. Meanwhile, a young man named Saul has made his way to Jerusalem. Now, Saul must have been a very bright, really up-and-comer. This guy is literally going places. You see, he is studying under the premier rabbi of the time, a rabbi whose name is Gamaliel. Gamaliel had an even more famous grandfather. I don't know if you've heard of him, but in uh, Jewish circles and in extra-biblical literature, he is uh, spoken of all the time. His name is Hillel. You'll still see Hillel centers on college campuses as kind of Jewish student unions, if you will. Well, Gamaliel is his grandson, and Gamaliel is famous in his own right, being very, very wise. Now, in this story, I'm going to pull together a lot of information out of your Bible, the book of Acts. I would just urge you to read it. All this adventure of the early church is recorded in the book of Acts. But I'm going to pull together things from some other letters and a lot of things from outside the Bible, but when I do, I'll tell you that. Well, Gamaliel is known better outside the Bible than he is inside the Bible, but Paul is studying under him. Now, I don't want you to think about this like being a university, like going to Harvard or going to MIT. I want you to think about this as clerking for the Supreme Court Chief Justice because the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court has, I think, five law clerks, and so they're hand-picked clerks, and they come and work for a year, and they literally work closely with the uh, justices. Well, that's what this is like. He's one of a few hand-picked young men who are able to work with Gamaliel. He knows multiple languages. He knows the science of the time. He's read Greek literature. He studied the Talmud. He studied the Old Testament. He's a very learned young man, probably in his early 20s at this time. Well, he's studying under Gamaliel, and he's got a bright future. I mean, he could be Supreme Court Chief Justice. He could go into politics and be a leader. He is an up-and-coming young Jewish scholar. Well, there's a young man who's a Christian named Stephen. Now, Stephen's a Jew, but he's Greek in origin because he has a Greek name. And he began to speak in Jerusalem, and he began to reason from the Scriptures. He began to say, this Jesus is prophesied about. Well, people got very angry about that. They couldn't refute what he was saying. It made sense, but it threatened everything, and it was blasphemy. So they pulled him in front of the authorities, and they 
tried to get him to say something that they could punish him for. Well, Stephen gave them everything they wanted. He gave this great speech, which you can read in the book of Acts, about the Jewish people and how God has been working through it and the Messiah, and this Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. When they heard that, they said, that's blasphemy, we're going to kill you. And sure enough, they dragged him out and they stoned him. They threw stones at him until he was dead. And the scripture says that Saul was there holding their coats. That's the first scripture I put on your note page. On that day, the day Stephen was stoned, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem and all except the apostles. The apostles are those 12 that Jesus specifically chose and gave power to go and the responsibility to take the word into the world. And they were all scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. That's basically the nation of Israel today. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Well, this young man is just on fire to stamp out this Christianity. And with his learning, he would go from house to house of people that were thought to be Christ followers, and he would cross-examine them and get them to say something that they could be put in prison for. But he's such an up-and-coming little young Jewish executive that he went to the chief priests and the elders and said, give me letters of introduction and I'm going to take the road north to Damascus, Syria, and I'll stamp out the church there as well. They thought, wow, this guy's really on fire. He's an up-and-comer. Watch that guy. And so they give him the letters, and he takes off. And so he's on this old, famous road that runs from Jerusalem. It runs all the way north to Damascus. And while he's on the road to Damascus, all of a sudden, a bright light shines. You can read about this at least twice in the book of Acts. Paul told this story over and over, if you will. The light shines, and everybody's scared to death, and they fall to their faces, and then Saul hears a voice, and here's what the voice says. Saul, I understand you have a problem with me. Well, okay, that's a kind of a loose translation. <laughs> this is like one of the biggest oh-no moments in all of history. It's like, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, who are you, Lord? I mean, he can't see, it's light. He said, I am Jesus the one that you're trying to stamp out. And so Paul, the light goes away. The other people heard noises, but they didn't know what it said. And Paul realizes he's blind. He can't see. And so they take him by the hand and they literally lead him on into Damascus. Meanwhile, in Damascus, Jesus had spoken to a Christian, a Christ follower there, a man named Ananias. He said, Ananias, there's going to be a guy come to town. His name is Saul and he's going to be blind and I want you to go talk to him. And Ananias said, I've heard about this guy and uh, we've been worried because he's going to try to kill us. He's going to try to get us put into jail. And God says, don't worry about that. I took care of that. You just go talk to him. <laughs> One of the best lines in the Bible, listen to this. He said, Ananias, I need you to tell him how much he must suffer for my name. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong impression. He wasn't saying, oh, I'm mad at Saul. I want you to go tell him, I'm mad, you're going to suffer, buddy. That's not what he means. He said, I have a journey. I have an adventure for him, but I need you to let him know it's going to be a hard road. It's going to be an Ernest Shackleton adventure. And so he does. He speaks to Saul and uh, says, rise up, be baptized, wash away your sins. He does, and he can see, and he immediately begins preaching in Damascus. So he's got some Jews there, you've got a lot of non-Jews, and he begins to reason. He begins to say, with all that learning, he said, my eyes literally has been opened. I have literally seen the light, and you know this Jesus is the Messiah. He is the risen Son of God. Well, that doesn't go over all that well there. And the guy changes his stripes, and so they decide, the rulers, the Jewish rulers and some of the secular rulers, they're going to kill him. In fact, they get so close to killing him and they're guarding the gates to find him that the scripture says, again in the book of Acts, that the believers there had to lower him over the city walls in the middle of the night in a basket, let him down by a rope so he could get out of town. Well, needless to say, that's not a good beginning to your preaching career. I mean, most preachers don't feel like that's a really good, like, oh, how was your first church? Well, they lowered me over the wall in a basket. I had to get out of town in the middle of the night, you know? So he goes to Arabia, goes back home to Tarsus, and the next we see him 
is in Antioch in Syria. Antioch in Syria is a church. There are a lot of believers there. Some of them are Gentiles, not Jews. Some of them are Jews who have become Christians, and Paul becomes a Sunday school teacher there in Antioch. Well, over time, the church in Antioch says, you know, we're very missional. We want to be part. The Great Commission is to go take the good news to all the world, and so let's do it. Paul, you're going to be a missionary. And so they send Paul, and he begins, over the next decade, he begins many journeys throughout the Roman world, going town to town and village to village and telling this good news. He tells this story of his Damascus Road experience, his conversion, his testimony, his story. Because you see, what I want you to see happening right now is really interesting. When Paul has an encounter with Jesus, it is a life changing event. I mean, before, think about what he was doing before. He was chasing everything the world had to offer. He had a promising future. And after, what's he doing? Town to town, preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. It was life changing. He made a change of priorities. He made a change of directions. You know what we call that? Repentance. The word repent means to change your direction, change your goals in life. It was life changing, but it was also life defining. You see, before, his life was defined by fame and success and achievement. But now, he's going to write this later. He's going to say, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In other words, his life is defined differently. In other words, it's no longer about achievement or fame or fortune. It's all about Christ's purpose in the world. And that purpose was for him to take the good news everywhere he went. Well, your second map is one of those journeys. So if you want to put that up or you want to look at it, this is the third of his great journeys. But this gives you an idea of where he went. And I want to give you an idea of the road he had to follow. For example, he went into Iconium. You'll see that city. It's in modern-day Turkey, one of the first cities he came to, and he began to preach. And let me, this is what happened everywhere he went. A number of people believed the good news. They said, this is wonderfully good news. I can walk in newness of life because of Jesus Christ bearing my sins on the cross and my trust in him. I can have a relationship with God. I can be reconciled to God. I can live a completely new life. And sure enough, people were flocking. But there were others who were very resistant. The Jewish leaders who had something to lose and even the secular leaders, the city council, the mayor of the towns, they would argue this. They would say, you know, these These Christ followers are not good citizens. They believe stuff we don't believe, and they just won't get with the program. They won't worship the emperor. They say he's not Lord. This Jesus is Lord. They won't worship all of the Roman gods. They say they're just idols. They won't come make sacrifices. They called the early Christians atheists, by the way, because they didn't believe in all those Roman gods. You know, it's a lot like our culture, isn't it? They basically persecuted them because they said, you know, you're not like us. You won't get with the program and believe what we believe. It's not like the Christians were out there saying, hey, you should yell at your kids and kick your dog. You know, you should be bad people. Well, they weren't bad people. They were, in fact, they were model citizens. And yet, that's what happened. Well, in Iconium, they stirred up some trouble, and Paul was hustled out of town right before they grabbed him. Well, he went to the next city, a city named Lystra. Wasn't so lucky. Same thing happened. He basically had tons of people coming to Christ and at the same time, great persecution. This time, however, they grabbed him before he got out of town and they dragged him out of town. Read about this in the book of Acts. And just like Stephen, they stoned him. They threw stones at him until they thought he was dead. Now, I don't know how bad a shape you have to be in for people to think you're dead, but you cannot. That had to hurt. Let me just put it that way. So they stone him. They think he's dead and they leave. So some of the Christians came, gathered around him and prayed and he got up and limps back into town. I mean, the next morning he's preaching. He's got bandages on, but he's preaching saying, hey, I've got good news. Come follow me as I follow Christ. This is a real adventure, people. That's what he was doing. Now, I don't know about you, but if it were me, I would have begun to question my calling. I would have said, you know, maybe God's trying to tell me something. I want you to know, I've taught some really bad lessons. Some of you are like, yeah, we know. Uh, (laughs) But nobody's tried to kill me yet for that. And yet Paul keeps going on. So a couple of things start to happen as he goes on this journey. He begins collecting like-minded people. A young man named Timothy can read the letters Paul wrote to Timothy. A young man named Titus, he wrote a letter to Titus. 
particularly for young people. First Timothy, that first letter to Timothy, is such an encouraging, spiritually uplifting letter to a young person trying to take the gospel to the world. Well, he begins to, God uses him to write these letters. He gets these people, begins sending them out. But somewhere along in this time period, he has filled out and filed so many health care claims that he has reached his already, early in the year, reached his out-of-pocket maximum. And his HMO decides that instead of continuing to file these claims, it's going to be cheaper just to give you a doctor. And so he meets this guy named Luke, and Luke is a Greek physician, and he becomes a Christian, and he travels with Paul. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't want any job that needs a traveling physician with you. I don't want that job, right? Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke from listening to what God had told Paul. He wrote the book of Acts as he traveled with Paul and put those things together. And so God used Luke, God used Paul to inspire these writings for us to read. Well, they go on place to place in Philippi, where he's beaten and put in jail. Moves on to Athens, the brightest people in the world where he preaches the resurrection of the dead. They're okay with this Jesus thing. It's kind of a weird thought. But when he gets to the idea that Jesus was raised from the dead, which for Paul was the crux of the good news. If Jesus isn't raised from the dead, he would write, then our faith is in vain. But we can live forever because he can live forever. He has overcome death. Well, the Athenian philosophers really struggled with this, and yet some believed. From there, he goes to Ephesus. Ephesus, a major city. You may remember what happened there, but this is really instructive to me. In Ephesus, let me tell you basically what happened. He spent a couple of years there. So it's in Turkey, and basically start churches all over the place in Turkey in the two years he's there. All these young people going out, spreading the gospel, starting churches, Christ followers. But what happened was so many people became Christians, it affected their economy. When you read this account about Ephesus, the reason they're angry with Paul is so many people became Christians that nobody's looking at porn anymore. Nobody's buying idols anymore. It is affecting the commerce of the city. Oh my goodness, what would it be like if we, we changed the behavior of our entire city and the economy of this city because we left that life and we now walk this life? Well, that's what happened. And so they get a riot started against Paul and they get into this big amphitheater and they chant for two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Artemis is that one of the Greek goddesses. And they said, that's our goddess. Forget this Jesus, bring this Paul in here. So Paul's there and he says, hey, I think I should go out and talk to him. And his friends go, we don't think you should go out and talk to them. You know, and so they hustle him on out of town. Well, he gets to Jerusalem. That's the end of the journey that's on your map there. And in Jerusalem, another riot. He simply tells his story, and when he says, God sent me to the Gentiles, he sent me to the non-Jewish people because salvation is for them too, they start a riot, and the Romans then bring him into the barracks. And they start to uh, torture him. This, this is really interesting. Ro here's Roman jurisprudence. Basically, nobody's testimony was considered trustworthy. They assumed everybody lies. So they would just torture you because they thought if your testimony wasn't taken under torture, you're probably lying. So they're just going to torture him, find out, why are these people mad at you? You seem to be the cause of the problem. I mean, I know you're thinking, why don't you arrest the guys that are beating him? No, no, no. You just get that one guy out of there and everybody is fine. And so they start to torture him and he says, hey, you know, I am a Roman citizen. And they go, whoa, you don't torture Roman citizens. And so they take him to the governor. Governor says, wow, you're preaching this Jesus. Uh, that's interesting. And he said, you want me to just turn you over to the Jews because they want me to hand you over because they want to talk to you. He says, no, I think they want to kill me. So Felix, Roman governor, says, well, God, that's a real problem because I'd really like to make the Jews happy, but I can't have them killing Roman citizens. So he holds him in prison for two years. Paul's in prison for two years for doing nothing wrong. Well, finally, new governor comes. His name is Festus. And so he's the Roman governor. He's new in town. And so he brings Paul in and says, look, I, I don't know what this deal is with this. You want to explain it? Paul preaches the gospel to him. He says, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you what happened. I was on the road and I was persecuting Christians and this, and he tells his story again. And so uh, Festus says, man, I don't, I don't understand all of this. So King Agrippa, one of Herod's 
grandsons comes and he says, hey, come here and listen to this guy and tell me what we ought to do with him. Well, they talk for a little while and finally Paul realizes they're going to turn him over to the Jews. And he says, I appeal to Caesar. I'm a Roman citizen and so I have a right to go to Rome and see Caesar. You see, Paul had been praying to God, God, I'd love to go to Rome and preach the gospel there, biggest city in the world. In fact, he'd written a letter to them called Romans in your New Testament. You should read the letter. It's brilliant. He says, I'm looking forward to coming and seeing you guys. So he'd been praying for it, and God said, Paul, I've answered your prayer. I've got you an all-expenses-paid trip to Rome. Okay, handcuffs, yes, but meals included. I mean, you have a trip to Rome, and so he does. So he goes to Rome, and when he gets to Rome, probably around 60 AD now, okay, and Nero is the emperor. Now, Nero Pardon me for using some technical psychological language here, but Nero is crazy. I mean, this guy's killed his mother, may have felt a little bad about it, killed at least one of his wives, one of his sons. I mean, he's just a power-hungry Roman emperor. And Paul's nothing to him, it's some Jewish dispute. And so, this is where the book of Acts ends. So now I'm gonna go into some extra biblical literature. And so, Tradition has it that he was released then, and I think that's true. He, that was when he was in prison and he wrote the book of Philippians. Remember, he wrote back to Philippi where he'd been persecuted, and he writes this letter all about joy. And he says, oh, by the way, I'm in prison, and by the way, I am converting these guards. I mean, he's just always upbeat. You know, one thing I've noticed about Paul, this is interesting, and I think it kind of applies to us too. I'm going to just tell you, Paul had a harder road to walk than I did. And yet, I never hear Paul saying, you never see him reading, you never hear it saying, God, why do I have such a hard road and Terry has such an easy road compared to me? Why is her life not as tough as mine? He never does. He never says that. He said, I know that it will be a hard road at times. And so, he plows through. Well, I think he got out of prison and he's always been wanting to go to Spain. It's on your map, it's called Espana. That was the Roman province. And it's possible that he did. And so, he probably went on preaching. But in the meantime, something happened back at Rome. In 64 AD, we're now into extra biblical sources, so this is just historically dated, 64 AD, Nero decides he needs to do some urban renewal. And so he literally pays some guys to torch part of Rome. Well, they are slums. Rome was like a cesspool of the world. I mean, biggest city in the world, but tons of slums. I mean, the fire spread like crazy, killed tens of thousands of people. And so at the end, Nero's like, oh, that is so bad. Okay, engineers, let's go. We're going to build some nice stuff here, right? Well, sure enough, the Roman historians, Tacitus is one of them. Tacitus is a Roman guy, not a, not a believer. None of these people are Christians. And he's writing about Nero, and he said, all the people suspected that Nero set that fire, and it made him very unpopular. His popularity rating was even lower than Donald Trump's at that moment. I mean, it... <laughs> His popularity rating went down. So Nero doubled down, though. He said, it wasn't me. It was the Christians, those people that won't even worship. You know, yeah, hey, all over the empire, people are telling me about these Christians, and it's them. Tacitus records that he began to persecute the Christians to draw attention from himself. And so he had uh, them torn apart by lions in the Colosseum. It said, Tacitus said that he would coat Christians in pitch, in uh, tar, and light them on fire as torches in Rome at night. He said it got so brutal, even the Roman citizens thought, enough, enough. But he began to persecute them. Well, sometime in this time period, Paul is arrested again and brought back to Rome. And this time, Paul knows the circumstances are different, and he's not going to escape. This is the time when he wrote the second letter to Timothy, that young man who's now out there spreading the gospel. And he says this in 2 Timothy 4, 6. He says, I am being poured out like a drink offering. He writes from a Roman prison. In other words, my life is spent, I left nothing on the field. And the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And so Paul is beheaded in the year 67 or 68. The reason you know that is in 68, according to historical records, Nero killed himself. And his uh, reign ended as badly as it began, but he likely beheaded the apostle Paul. Well, our story ends there, but I want to kind of sum it up with the verse I put at the bottom of your note page. 
Because I want you to think about a couple of things. I want you to think about the before and the after. If anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. He said, if you're counting on your achievements, I'm more accomplished than you guys, or I was. I was uh, uh, circumcised on the eighth day, just like the law of Moses said. I'm of the people of Israel. Listen, people, I don't know what you have going for you, but I was one of God's chosen people. People of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regards to the law, I was a Pharisee, the most devout sect. As for enthusiasm, I persecuted the church. As for righteousness, I was flawless in following the law. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost everything. But I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. That's Paul's perspective, if you will, on the life before and the life after. And so now I'd like to take just a couple of minutes and I want to convince you of something. First point, number one, it's really easy to hear stories of people like Ernest Shackleton, for example, and say, wow, heroic, don't know how those guys did it. I, I would not have made it. That unbelievable journey. And to read these true stories of the life of Paul and say, wow, what faith. I mean, what keeps you going? I mean, to so be in love with Jesus Christ to say, everything that I gave up, all the accomplishments are nothing compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ, of being secure to know that he holds my life for eternity, that whatever happens here has nothing to do with the glory that will be revealed in me, as Paul would write. So you think about that and you kind of put him on a pedestal and it's really easy to do. And we say, oh, wow, he was a hero of the faith. He was something else. Here's my contention. Paul is no different than you are. Paul bled like you bleed. He had doubts like you have doubts. What he had was faith. And here's my point is God requires no greater achievement of you than he did of Paul. He requires no greater achievement of you and me than this to be faithful in our circumstances. That's all Paul did. He said, I can do all things through Christ who enables me to deal with these sufferings. And I know some of you are walking a hard road right now. And God says, be faithful in those hard circumstances. And there are others who are walking a, a smooth road. And God said, be faithful in that prosperity. God expects of us the same thing of Paul. And some of us will walk harder roads, some of us will walk roads that seem, at least, to be easier. But every single road, God says, be faithful in your circumstances, whatever they may be, and trust that I will bring you through. We are just like Paul, and we too are on a journey. We too are on a journey. You see, we all have had a Damascus Road experience. Now, I'm not saying you've had as dramatic an experience as Paul had. I'm not saying you had a supernatural experience. I know some of you have had some very dramatic experiences. Others, like me, not so dramatic, but still clear. I used to do this, and then I did that. I used to value this, but then I valued that. I used to chase the things of this world, and now I pursue the interest of Christ. Every one of us has a Damascus Road experience. Every one of us has a time when we turned. If that hasn't happened in your life, that can happen any time you decide, that's no longer what I want. I want to follow Jesus Christ. And for those of us who say we want to follow Jesus Christ, we pray for faith to trust him in every circumstance because that's what he asks of us. Following Christ for Paul was life-changing and life-defining, and that's no different than you and me. I want you to think about yourself as on an adventure. You say, well, but it's hard sometimes, I know. Think about the adventure stories I just told you. You don't know an adventure story that doesn't have hardship in it. It's not an adventure unless it has trials and difficulties. And so as you're in your trials and difficulties, I want you to think about this. You are on an adventure and God is with you. And all he asks is be faithful in these circumstances. Now, like Paul, he devoted his life to spreading the gospel. And you know what? That's the same mission you and I have. And I know you're getting nervous. You're saying, oh no, he's going to say we need to go overseas. He's going to say we need to go stand on the street corner and tell people about Jesus. No, here is your assignment. Here's what I really want you to do. I want you to share your Damascus Road experience. 
I want you simply to tell your story. Our centered groups, by the way, will be starting up here soon. Watch your bulletins for it. One of the best things people get out of the centered 10-week uh, experience is everybody kind of writes their story, their Damascus Road experience, if you will, and shares it. It's one of the richest times. People go, wow, now I feel like I could just tell that story. It's as simple as, that's what I used to be, and this is what I am now. That's what I used to be heading for, and I'm not perfect, but this is the direction I'm going now. I want you to tell your Damascus Road experience to somebody. Let's get involved in this adventure of spreading the gospel in the world. Can you do that? Tell your story to somebody this week. Be faithful in the circumstances in which we find ourselves, and God will be faithful to us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we look back on this adventure, I confess to you that sometimes I, I want to put Paul on a pedestal and I want to say he was superhuman. He was beyond what I could do, but I know better. I know that your word tells me that he had the same struggles that I have and that you expect nothing more of me than to be faithful just like you did him. I thank you for the path you've given us to walk. We in this country, by just the virtue of being born in this country, walk an easier path many times. And yet we too face trials, sickness, economic problems, relational problems. Father, we don't find this uh, to be an easy road even so, but we know that you are with us and we know that you use everything in our lives for your glory. At the same time that we feel like we're struggling, your church is expanding. Give us the courage to speak up and share our simple stories and to be faithful as the Apostle Paul was faithful. We love you and we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you as you go this week.